Welcome to Inspire Campfire, a podcast where ordinary people tell their stories of extraordinary adventure. These are campfire stories meant to inspire the rest of us to light the fire within, get outside, follow our dreams, and return to tell our own stories. Ready? Let's strike the match. Welcome to the show. I am your host, Scott Wurzbacher, and today I am so excited to expand awareness by bringing you listeners what some might consider far-reaching topics such as clairvoyance, telepathy, near-death experiences, and reincarnation. For today's guest who has become deeply connected to these themes, it all started with that voice that called him to adventure and a mystical experience he had many years ago in India. Are you intrigued? Our guest is Patrick Belial, a practical mystic, nonprofit executive, teacher, and world traveler from Charlottesville, Virginia. He studied business and theology with Benedictine monks at Minnesota College and meditated with Buddhist monks in Thailand. He spent a full year traveling around the world with his wife, Jane, as they searched for the meaning of life. And what you're about to hear is the story of someone who had the courage to follow his bliss and how he was rewarded with a life filled with purpose, serving organizations that align with his deepest values and beliefs. For decades, Pat has been lecturing and raising money for Edgar Cayce's Association for Research and Enlightenment in Virginia Beach. The University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies, also known as DOPS, which is researching the nature of consciousness, United Way, UVA's children's hospitals, and dozens of other charities. Pat enjoys nothing more than sharing his wisdom and love of life with everyone he meets, and I promise this will be a truly enlightening conversation. Pat, welcome to the campfire. Thank you so much, Scott. I'm so happy to be here, and that sounded pretty awesome. (laughs) <laughs> well, a lot to live up to. It, yeah, it's. Uh, I don't think we're going to disappoint here. I've, uh, I've, I've heard your story, and I, uh, I'm just blown away, and I cannot wait to, to share this with our listeners. Um, we have so much to cover, and uh, I want to get through as much of it as we can, Pat. I just love your story so much. I wonder if, if you could just maybe just give a, a quick little overview of maybe how you would introduce yourself to somebody for the first time that's never met you. <laughs> well, definitely it depends on who they are and, and how open they are to some of the things that you just mentioned. <laughs> Usually, you know, it's, it's safe to start with the, the the fact that I've worked for nonprofits for my entire career, Yeah, my enti- entire adult life. I've been looking to be of service to folks, uh, you know, right out of college. Uh, but uh, and and then the next step is you know wanting to be of service specifically to kids. Uh, I I was a camp counselor. You mentioned Edgar Casey before. I was a camp counselor at Edgar Casey camp, teaching things like meditation, watching your dreams for meaning, and following your intuition. A lot like what you you know you talk about on this show. Just really teaching them or training them to do that and encouraging them to do it. Uh, I like the press, the practical mystic term though too, because it gives people an idea. It's like, wait, what now? I get the practical part, like, you know, I've had a job all this time and I'm living life, but the mystical part, if they're intrigued, you know, they'll say, Tell me about that. What does that mean? And then we get into all the fun stuff. So Pat, tell me about that. What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, Scott, it all began. I actually was born dead. Uh, that that's one of the places I get to start. I, I claim to have had a near death experience the day I was born. My mom told me I was born without a heartbeat, mm. and uh, and she, as a result, told me I had a you know God had a very special plan for me or special purpose, and so I was always looking for that purpose and always felt called to something higher, uh, and so yeah, I mean it goes all the way back to the the first day of my my life, uh, and then you know as a Catholic boy I. I went through confirmation and really felt uh, called to follow spirit. And, uh, you know, again, it, it, it all, it's been my whole life path, let's just say, trying to find that inner voice and follow it. 
Yeah. And that's, that's, that's what we love to talk about on this podcast is that voice that calls us to adventure. But I think that's such an interesting point that that seed was planted in you since before you can even remember that you had a purpose that you were here to fulfill. Yeah. I can't emphasize that enough to any parents who are listening to, to really let their kids know that, that they are here for a reason. And none of us really can tell each other or our kids, you know, what that purpose might be. But if you just put that seed in them, that, uh, that huh, it's not just about selfishness or what I can get out of life. There's something yeah. bigger than myself. Yeah, I love that. It's a it's a great lesson for for parents and kids, really. Um, so what I want to I want to go ahead and jump to um, Pat and his wife Jane, and almost thirty years ago, making this decision that you're going to travel the world for a year. Yeah, and uh, so much kind of came from that trip. And so I wonder if you can just kind of help us understand what led to that trip and 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 how that happened. Sure. So Jane and I went to college in Minnesota. Uh, I went to a Catholic college. She went to a Lutheran college, and we ended up recruiting high school students to go to our respective colleges. So we met that way, and and uh, got married. And uh, we actually, I was raising money for United Way in St. Paul, but I got recruited out to the Evergreen State College in Olympia, Washington. Okay. We moved out there for a couple of years. And so we, we'd been following what I call the American template. You know, you, you graduate high school, college, get a job, get married, make money. Uh, and then in our late twenties, we were in this place where we were doing all that, and yet we both felt unfulfilled and started to really have feelings of restlessness. And, you know, like, like I don't know what's wrong because everything's mm-hmm. perfect. I mean, we're, we live in a beautiful spot, making good money, doing good things for people. Yeah. Yet we felt somehow unfulfilled. And so we decided to, to take the, our nest egg, which was only $20,000 at the time, and uh, spend it on one year around the world. And part of it was just screwing around. You know, we went to New Zealand and Australia and, and met some really wonderful people there. But then we went to places like China uh, and Thailand, where we meditated with Buddhist monks, as you mentioned. Yeah. And, and then the Osho commune in India for a month. And those were really some of the, the, the deeper uh, places that really helped shift our paradigm. It... Uh, it's just, it's really what we felt that we needed to do, get out of America and really put on some other mindsets from other cultures. By the way, we were not supported by our families or friends. They, they all thought we were a little crazy. You know, our, our parents were like, why did we send you to college if this, <laughs> if this is what you're going to do? Uh, and one friend said, well, how's that going to look on your resume? <laughs> and we said, well, if, if, if somebody that we want to work for doesn't like that on our resume, we don't want to work for them, you know, so. But here's what I love about your story, because 30 years later, we can, you can, you can go, see? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. That is the big lesson that you're always taken care of if you follow your inner guidance. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, that and that's it. That is that is what we are here. That is the message that that I hope for people to hear when when they listen to this podcast. And um, so I want to I want to get into some of the experiences that you had there. But I wonder, just like sort of that that decision making process, because that is a big deal. Just to say, you know, we're going to take everything we have and we're going to go travel for a year. Mm-hmm. What was that process like? The decision making. Were there any fears and doubts? Like, oh my you know, gosh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so we, it was kind of a process. Jane had applied to uh, potentially be an exchange uh, employee with uh, a government in uh, in Japan. Actually, that's what started the whole process. We're like, maybe we should live abroad for a year. So we thought maybe Japan. Mm-hmm. Then that didn't work out. And then we thought, well, maybe we'll go someplace like Australia where we don't have to learn the language, uh, but to get a difference in culture. And then we heard about this round the world plane ticket that somebody's brother had done. You could get a six month ticket or a year long ticket. And we we said, oh, my gosh, that'd be so great to do a one year trip around the world and go to all those places. And then some. so we sat in a coffee shop in Olympia and wrote it out on a napkin, you know, where where we really wanted to go. Uh, And then. You know, Jane, as you're pointing out, Scott, Jane is the more practical of the two of us. I'm, I like to live in these big ideas and the head in the clouds kind of thing sometimes. 
uh, even though I am a practical mystic, uh, she is the one that went there first when I said, well, what about a trip around the world? Jane says, well, what will we do with our stuff? You know, like she went right to like pack it, store it and all that stuff. Um, let alone the things that, that you were, we were talking about before, the family not supporting. And you know, her mom says, well, you know, the world's a dangerous place. Like, why would you travel? So, yeah, we overcame a lot of that resistance and a lot of the practical stuff, too. I, I asked my organization for a one-year leave of absence and we, after only working there for two years, and they gave it to me. That's the other thing. You just never know till you ask. Yeah, that's great. So you, you had a backup plan. Uh, yeah, that's true. Although I kind of wish I hadn't in the end. You know, it's like because I had that potential uh, safety net, let's say, yeah. uh, I feel like I wasn't entirely out on the, the, the tightrope. Uh, but that's why the next phase of our life <laughs> happened, because we really wanted to continue to follow spirit now that we'd become addicted to spirit and knew we were taken care of, but I don't want to get yeah. it. You, you did. And we're definitely going there. Um, I think the one thing that I want to touch on before we jump into your experience in India though, is that yeah. describe this, it wasn't just to find the meaning of life. And so I wonder if we could go back to that, like the, the intention of it. Can you yeah. just talk about the intention? Like that's, that's a big thing in your, in your late twenties to say, we're going to go look for the meaning of life. Yeah. Well, as I mentioned, we just felt unfulfilled, uh, you know, and unsatisfied with just what I'll call the material gains that we'd made. Um, and, you know, I'd read uh, philosophers and theologists and <laughs> theologians, I guess it is, um, you know, Freud and Jung and, and uh, Man's Search for Meaning and all these great books. And it really did get me thinking that, that uh, I, and plus my mom's, you know, you're, you're here for a special purpose. Yeah. All that sort of weighed on me to think, you know, is this it? I'm just going to be raising money for scholarships at a college, you know? Uh, so yeah, and Buddhism in particular um, appealed to me at that stage in my life. We'd been taking some meditation classes and, and, you know, Buddha reminds us that all truth comes from inside of us. Uh, and so I really took that seriously and was trying to put myself in situations where I could be open to that universal wisdom, let's say, coming through me or tapping into that in some way. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's what I was looking for. Uh, now, granted, you know, some of it before for the uh, mystical experience you mentioned. So, yeah. So when we were in China, for instance, yeah. uh, we met this guy who uh, said, you know, oh, you're from America. I think you are the least free country on earth. And we wow. said, what are you talking about? You know, we'd, we'd been taught from birth that we're, we're the bastion of freedom, you know? And, and, uh, and I, so I said, what are, you, you know, what are you talking about? And he said, well, look, if you live up to the American dream and you have a mortgage on your house and a car payment and two weeks of vacation every year, you are totally tied to your material possessions. You're not free. And I thought, wow, and that's that was kind of a shocker to me. Now I said, no, wait a second, but here I am. I, I didn't, I don't have a mortgage or a car payment, and here I am in your country. You can't travel to my country. At least at that time, he couldn't, right? 1994, they were just opening up. Uh, and he said, well, I can go out anywhere in my country whenever I want to go, and my government takes care of me. You know, I don't have to worry about whether I'm going to be homeless or starve to death. So we have per a lot of personal freedom that you Americans don't have. So I was getting that kind of wonderful perspective. I considered it wonderful perspective yeah. outside of the paradigm along the way. But it's, that definitely is not the same as mystical wisdom. Hey everyone, it's Scott here. Did you know that the members of my real estate team, W Realty Group, are listening to their own voices that call to adventure by setting big goals? Some of those goals include planning trips to Bali and the Kingdom of Bhutan, buying investment homes and running the Chicago Marathon. At W Realty Group, we support and encourage these big goals and want to help turn them into reality. We're currently looking to add new members to the team. If you know a great real estate agent in the Charlotte, North Carolina area that would benefit from being part of our team, please send a text, an email, or give me a call. And know that when you support W Realty Group, you're also supporting this podcast. Thanks for listening. Yes. So let's go there. So on this one year trip, you, you landed for a period of time at the Osha commune in India. 
And uh, I wonder, I want to talk about what happened to you there. I wonder if you could just kind of describe what that is for listeners and, and how you ended up there. <laughs> well, that's another story. So I'll start in Thailand. Uh, I mentioned we meditated with Buddhist monks mm -hmm. uh, at a monastery in Thailand. And we had a miserable experience to, to make, to just get right to the point. Yeah. Uh, you know, we woke up at five in the morning, we ate at six and 1130 and then no solid foods after noon. It was super hot, meditated for anywhere from six hours to 12 hours a day uh, without much guidance really. Uh, and anyway, it was, it was, it was not good. And, uh, and then yet we, we're still open to other possibilities of yeah. spiritual exploration. So when we got to Bangkok and we were about to fly over to Calcutta, India, uh, for the first time, mm -hmm. we, we were told that there was a Air India strike right when we were at the airport. And so all of us who were going to be on that flight ended up at this hotel for a couple of days until they worked out the strike. Well, we kept bumping into this one guy who was going to be on our flight. And he was really intriguing looking, sort of the quintessential sort of Jesus hippie kind of look, you know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, but he's from South America uh, of Italian descent. His spiritual name was Pranshu. And uh, Pranshu just kept dropping these little nuggets of wisdom that were so intriguing to me. I just, and then again, when we kept bumping into him, I kept getting more and more. So I finally said, you know, where is this community that you live in in India that you keep talking about? He said it's called the Osho Commune. And if you're interested, here's a book that Osho, uh, of Osho's talks. So I took it back to my hotel room and I, I read it all in about three hours and just devoured it. It was amazing. And so I told Jane, we have to go to this place. And she said, well, it's way out of the way of where we're going to be in India. We were just going to go across the northern part of India. And Pune is where the Osho Commune is way yeah. down south. Yeah. Uh, up in the hills from Bombay. Anyway, I convinced her and she, bless her heart, was open to the possibilities. So we took a 44 hour train ride in 100 degree wow. heat in third class uh, on our fifth wedding anniversary, by the way. Wow. To get down to Pune. And we walked up toward the, the commune. And out of the 8,000 people who were there at the time, guess who's the first person we bumped into magically at the gate? Mm. Banshu. Pranshu was right there waiting for us and he welcomed us and uh, we we went into the commune and Jane by the way had said one week that's it you know you know after that buddhist experience i'm not going to stay more than <laughs> that's great well again we ended up staying a month cuz it was just so blissful and full of love and connection and just juicy lively people uh, really exploring life and living life to the fullest. It was just a beautiful, wonderful place. It's magical. And I'm, I, I think you're familiar with Joseph Campbell and his hero's journey. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm just sitting here thinking, you know, when, when your heart is open and you're ready to cross the threshold, these supernatural guides appear. And I'm just thinking Pranchu must have felt like a supernatural guide for you. 100%. Yeah. yeah. It was, it really was magic. So Pat, what happened there at Osho? Yeah, so we 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 went in. So it cost something like you know thirty cents a day to participate in all the activities of the community, uh, including all sorts of different types of meditation that you could learn. And then they did have these programs you could pay for, but it was something like you know forty dollars for a three day program. Mm -hmm. Everything cheap in India. So I, I I participated in one called opening to feelings, okay, or opening up to emotions, I guess, uh, and it was doing that through breath work. Have you done breath work before? I'm familiar with it. There's rebirthing. This one was called pulsation therapy. Okay. Anyway, what they do is they get you into an altered state of consciousness through essentially controlled hyperventilation. Okay. Uh, and then they do some work with you while you're in this altered state. So, you know, on the, probably the second or third day, you know, we'd been doing some really deep work in, in getting in touch with our emotions and expressing emotions, which, as you know, especially in our culture, is discouraged by men. Right. At least it was back in my day. Yeah. Um, so anyway, it was a really powerful class. And one day, should I, should I just jump right into my mystical experience? And how yes, it please. I am, we're, I'm on the edge of my seat. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you. It's, I mean, I'm, it's, 
as we say, by the grace of God, this happened. Again, I, you just have to keep putting yourself in the place where it's, it's possible. Our teacher had us lay down in a circle on the floor. There were 15 of us, and we were essentially head to foot, you know, just around this circle okay. on, on the ground. And she instructed us to do this, this pulsation therapy, this breath work, got us into this altered state. And then she says, you know, bring into your mind someone with whom you have unfinished emotional business. And so, like most men, I suppose, I called my father forward and started the whole conversation. She said, have the conversation in your mind. And so I say, you know, why didn't you tell me that you love me? And, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm weeping and I'm, I'm really feeling this all come up and it just feels really cleansing and, and good. Um, and then she says, now become that other person and answer yourself, basically, as if you were them. And it just felt so real. And I gained so much understanding. And, you know, my dad said, hey, I was, I was raised on a dairy farm in Wisconsin. Yeah. You know, you think my parents were teaching me emotional language? You know, no. I knew that they loved me when they got up before sunrise every morning to go milk the cows. You know, that kind of action showed yes. me that they loved me. And that's how I tell you I love you is through going to work every day. He worked at 3M. Uh, but uh, anyway, so yeah, that that's how I show you I love you. And Acts of service. It was, exactly. It was so, that's right. That's his love language. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was so meaningful to me and, and at a very deep level. And at that point, I just started laughing uncontrollably. You know, I just felt so light in this altered state. And then it just, after the laughing subsided, I, I just felt total peace. You know, just beautiful, silent peace. And in that piece, sort of out of nowhere, this bluish purple light just swooped in or faded in, whatever, just took over. And that bluish purple light was also unconditional love. Mm. And whatever I am just dissolved or disappeared. Uh, so I wasn't there, and yet I was connected to everything. I could see with my eyes closed, I could see everything in the room including all 15 of us in that circle. And I had a sense of things that were going on in, in other people's lives, sort of what I'll call a psychic experience, yeah. connection with them. Uh, and all I remember really is that, that sense of being loved and being love and be, love being the only thing that exists. And it didn't matter if I was king of the world or in prison that I was always taken care of and that everything is exactly as it should be. Now, that's a hard lesson when you put your left mind on it. But in that state, it was absolutely real. And I knew it. It wasn't just a belief. It was just truth. It just existed. So, so yeah, I just, I'm so grateful to have experienced that or touched that, that loving oneness. Uh, you could call it God. Uh, and I don't know if I was there for 30 seconds or 10 minutes, but... Uh, our, our teacher started talking again and brought us back into the room. And, and I came out of that having a sense of the fact that something really important had happened to me. But, but you know, in the moment, it's hard to really get a gauge on it. But I went looking for Jane, who was elsewhere in the commune, because I wanted to tell her about it. And what I noticed was as I was walking through and past these beautiful plants and trees, they looked so crisp and alive and colorful and i could hear the birds louder than i had before and just again everything just felt more alive and i learned later scott that my eyesight had actually improved so i had physical healings as a result of this metaphysical experience my eyesight went from 2035 to 2015 which i didn't even know was a thing and then my hearing i went years later to the to the doctor and had a hearing test and and he said haven't you ever been to a rock concert <laughs> said, yeah man i've been to monsters of rock and i was leader in a rock lead singer in a rock band yeah he said but you have a, the hearing of a seven-year-old you know your eardrums don't show the normal wear and tear and i said the only thing i can think of is this mystical experience that, that gave me these physical healings i can't explain it but there it is 
I mean, I, I, I'm blown away. And I, and I know that, you know, since you've, you've done lots of research and become involved in organizations that study this sort of thing, like looking back, can you describe like what, what happened? (laughs) Uh, I wish I could. (laughs) I mean, you know, a lot of people have a lot of theories, right. And, and you know, about some ideas around quantum physics, about how we're all connected at a, at a deep level and that there is yeah. no such thing as matter. Yep. And Max Planck theorized that, that the conscious consciousness is actually the building block of the universe. And so I think that I was there. I think that I was in that unified field, that, that pure consciousness, the idea of yeah, loving thought. And, uh, but, but how, how one gets there through something like you know, breath work, I can't describe, you know, that, we, that that's what this research group that you mentioned that I work with is looking for is sort yeah. of what, are, what are the mechanisms that can get people to this experience, let's say, because it really is transformative. I would wish this on everybody. Yeah. And so first of all, I mean, is this something that was completely unexpected for you? Is it something that you were hoping for? Had you heard about something like this before? No, never heard of it. Although I will say, I mean, having been raised Catholic and studying some theology, you know, I'd, I'd heard about and read about mystics, uh, you know, from Thomas Merton, a modern mystic, to, you know, a lot of the saints of old describe God experiences. But I certainly am not, was not a saint. Uh, and so I, I wasn't looking to describe my experience quite that way. Uh, but but it is that I think it is that same universal human experience. You know, mine did involve light, which is very common, and it was transformative. I came back a different person afterwards. So it is a, a, a normal human experience. Is just how, they're all a little bit different, and I don't know. I wish I could just say, do step one, two, and three, and you can get there. Yeah. Well, and so, you know, as, as a, as a, you know, young man, really in your late twenties at that point, was there anyone there at OSHA commune to kind of help give you any sort of guidance or talk you through the experience and what had happened? Uh, I'll say yes. Um, but again, I was still integrating it. I didn't really know how to talk about it at the time, Yeah. but definitely people there were like, Oh my gosh, you should read autobiography of a yogi by Hansa <laughs> Yogananda or yeah, it's right. It's right here on my shelf. This one. Oh, right. <laughs> oh that's awesome. Way to go. But, uh, so, you know, they, so they, in that sense, they were able to, to give me some guidance, uh, yeah. but no one else that I had talked to there had had anything quite like that happen. Yeah. Now, some of them also had been dabbling with psychedelic medicines, as we call them today, right? <laughs> uh, psilocybin or LSD, and they they described some some similar feelings or, or experiences. Right. People have have described that with those with those substances, but to be clear, yours was entirely out of the breath work. That's exactly right. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've still to this date never done psychedelic medicines, although I've learned a lot about them and studied them and and think that there's a lot of good coming from it. Yeah. It's an interesting topic, perhaps for another podcast at some point, but so you've described this mystical experience really as kind of a pivotal turning point in your life. How, how did this experience change you and what happens next? Well, that's the, that's the whole thing. As you can imagine, Scott, I mean, how do you integrate back into the world once you've touched love, you know, and timelessness uh, how do you go back to a job and put on a suit and tie and get to meetings on time and and try to meet the goal? And, you know, when you really know at a deep level that everything is OK, just the way it is, you don't have to meet the goal. It'll be OK. <laughs> and, and it's all about love and you're loved whether or not you show up on time or whatever. So that's where this practical mystic piece comes in. I, I still feel grateful that I came back with my left brain intact, Mm -hmm. looking for answers to what happened to me uh, so that it could be helpful to other people who have similar things happen. Because you you know Eckhart Tolle, Tolle, of course. Eckhart Tolle, when he had his mystical experience, he was sleeping on park benches for a long time. Like he he couldn't reintegrate into life. Uh, I didn't go that far with it. Uh, thankfully, uh, you know, I, Jane and I stayed together and <laughs> I had to go back to our old jobs in Olympia. And, you know, because it was there, like I say, 
for the taking, but I just, I couldn't do it. It just didn't matter. And so after a few months uh, and, and, you know, we'd saved up a couple of thousand bucks because we came back broke, of course. Uh, but after a couple of months of saving up some money, we decided to jump in our little Honda Civic and wander America until we'd run out of money and, and we'd figure out where we go and get jobs and save up another couple thousand bucks and wander some more <laughs> and just keep following spirit like that, that inner voice we keep coming back to at the campfire and see where it felt like we should go. Yeah. And, and so just to kind of fast forward for listeners and, and to get to um, some of the organizations that you're now working with, you yeah. spent three years traveling the United States and ultimately land in Charlottesville, Virginia. That was, that was no accident though. That was, that was, you know, again, we were, we were following spirits. So that meant we, we, we knew when it was time to stop mostly because we needed money and then we'd be like you know what let's go to maine for the summer never been to maine and then we'd get there and we'd meet the right person who had the right job had a place for us to stay for a couple months and long and short of it is along the way we were also coming up with our list of criteria for our perfect place to settle when the right time came to settle and charlottesville is the one that the place that met our criteria and again doors opened like crazy once we got here and uh and it just so happened that two of the most meaningful organizations that helped me reintegrate uh, after my mystical experience uh, are in Virginia. Uh, you mentioned both of them earlier. One is Edgar Casey's Association for Research and Enlightenment. That's down in Virginia Beach, uh, three hours from Charlottesville. Uh, and I ended up working for them for 15 years, uh, in addition to being a camp counselor for a separate 15 years. Yeah. Uh, and then the other one is right here in Charlottesville at the University of Virginia, the Division of Perceptual Studies. And it was their work, uh, and Ian Stevenson specifically, he started the, the division. Uh, that work is objective science. There's really no subjective uh, experience. Uh, it, it's not just touchy-feely, in other words. It's really concrete. And that's what I felt like I needed. It really helped ground me. Because I knew over the years, uh, I'd, I'd learned that you can't trust your own perception, let's just say. Uh, so you have to look at the patterns. And uh, and so DOPS, this group, mm -hmm. has you know thousands of cases of near-death experiences, little kids who remember past lives, psychic phenomena, and mystical experiences. And so I, I just I wanted to get in there and see... Uh, how I fit in, if how, if my mystical experience is common or not common, and what you know, again, how we can help people like me uh, integrate it into their lives. Yeah, I, I'm curious if you can go a little bit more in depth because I'm so I'm so intrigued by the work that DOPS does. Yeah. Um, just maybe tell us a little bit more, and I and I do love because you being a practical mystic fits and plugs in so nicely with with the work that they do there. Yeah, yeah, it's very true. Yeah, so. So Ian Stevenson, who started the division, uh, had he was he was the head of psychiatry at UVA. So super smart guy, MD, and people kept coming to him with kids who said they remembered a past life or think people that could do psychic phenomena, and nobody was looking at that. They they all sort of just wrote it off. Uh, but Ian didn't. He he published some papers uh, along the way on these subjects and. It, he was discovered by a guy named Chester Carlson, who invented the Xerox process. Mm -hmm. And Chester Carlson ended up giving a million bucks to fund Ian's research. So over the years, he had enough money to create this. It was, at the time, it was the Division of Parapsychology. Uh, and they started researching all this stuff. What is consciousness? You know, how, what does the brain produce consciousness? The answer is no, by the way. Uh, or is the brain more of a filter for mind beyond brain? Uh, and that's that's the model that essentially has come out of Dopp's work. Uh, it's you know, not concrete yet, but that's the idea. So now, after 50 plus years uh, of existence, they have 2,500 cases of three-year-old children who remember past lives. That have been ver many of which have been verified uh, factually. Uh, th same things with near-death experiences. Bruce Grayson uh, wrote a book last year called After, 
uh, which documents his 50 years of research in near-death experiences, uh, where people who are clinically dead uh, have experiences of consciousness outside their bodies, which can be verified. They come back into their body with information that they couldn't have possibly known. Uh, and so, you know, how do you explain that? You, you know, the current scientific physicalist paradigm can't explain it. So DOPS is still out on the fringes looking for all this stuff. Same thing again, mediumship, psychic phenomena. We're still doing all of that research in the lab here at the University of Virginia. Yeah. And so Pat, for you, especially like in that, in that early time when you got to Charlottesville and you're just, you're just learning about DOPS, mm -hmm. like for somebody that was born without a heartbeat, like this, <laughs> this had to resonate for you. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I knew I had to be part of it. I'll just say it that way. My first job in Charlottesville was running a teen center, uh, helping kids keep, stay off the street and out of trouble. And, uh, but at the same time, I was only three blocks away from DOP's office. So I went over there and knocked on their door <laughs> and said, hey, I know you guys. You don't know me, but I know you. And I'd love to work with you. And they said, thanks, but no thanks. That's the, that's the long and short of it is they did ask me to Tell them about their mystical experience, my my mystical experience, and yeah. lots some surveys and that sort of thing to be part of the research. Uh, but it was years later when I was working for UVA Children's Hospital and having success raising money for them that uh, I went back to them and said, "Hey, is it time for me to be involved with your work?" And, and they said, "Yep, now we need you." And so we awesome. paid five or six million dollars for them in the years subsequent, uh, and so they're they're thriving pretty well right now, I would say. They're doing it's well. truly a match made in heaven. And perhaps you're a supernatural guide for them that came oh, along. Well, thanks for saying so. I wonder, like, if just to put things in context for listeners, is, th is there a story, you know, about a, a child that remembered a past life that you could share just to kind of give an, a, a concrete example? Yeah, you bet. Well, and I'll just tell people that want to look into it further themselves that they can just Google one. His name is James Leininger. And you can just Google boy who remembers being a World War II pilot. I think that's one of the most amazing stories. Um, and then the other one is this kid, Ryan, born to Christian parents in Oklahoma, no belief in reincarnation at all. Uh, and this little boy, two, two and three years old, talked about his life in Hollywood and, uh, and New York and you know, sort of this, you're not my mother kind of thing. And my mother is so-and-so and she lived here. And, and uh, back in my life, I lived in New York on this town with rock in the name and like really specific statements like that. He talked about Hollywood so much that her, his mom finally got a book of old Hollywood and she was flipping through and, and there was a picture, a black and white picture from the thirties. And the kid stopped her and said, mommy, that's me. And of course she freaked out. And then she says, the guy, he, the, the kid says the, this, and this is my buddy, George, who happened to be George Raft. If you remember some of those old mafia or gangster movies back in the thirties, George Raft was pretty well known. Uh, but this other guy in the picture wasn't known at all. And so our researchers had to go out to California and find the film archives and eventually found this guy, Marty Martin, who was just an extra in the movie as the statements came out about Marty Martin's life, all of them uh, were in line with Ryan's statements. In fact, he went from Hollywood out to New York. He became an agent for some people and, and lived on Roxbury Street. So Rock was in the name of his, I mean, just unbelievable. Like why, why would this little three-year-old kid in Oklahoma know about some guy who died, you know, in the, I guess Marty Martin died in the sixties. Right. And, uh, and by the way, the kid knew that he died at 61, even though the death certificate had said 59. Marty Martin had lied about his birthday. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> the kid, how would you know that? Yeah. So that's just one one story. Again, there are 2,500 stories. Yeah, it's really amazing, and you know, I think it's 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 a topic that that people could very easily uh, brush off. But you know, DOPS at the University of Virginia is doing real life research on this stuff. 
Um, I had the pleasure of meeting you in person a couple of months ago. I got to see the facility. I mean, th this is this is real stuff that's been going on. It's true. I mean, and that's that's the whole thing about it is I love the fact that it's at the University of Virginia because it was founded by Thomas Jefferson, mm -hmm. whose famous quote around here is that we will follow the evidence wherever it may lead. Right. So you have to keep your open mind. You can't just write this stuff off as, well, that, that's not even possible. Now, part of the criticism of Ian's work in the beginning was because he was finding cases all around the world, mostly in cultures who believed in reincarnation. And so that's why Jim Tucker, the, the current director of DOPS and the guy doing these kids who remember past life research, uh, is focusing on American cases because, you know, it, it seems to be universal. You don't have to just uh, believe in reincarnation. But clearly, as you say, a lot of parents here, if a kid says, you know, you're not my dad, or I was, you know, Bob Smith from Topeka, you know, sure, honey. Sounds like attitude to me. <laughs> exactly. Attitude or imagination or whatever, and you, you just brush it off. But whereas cultures who believe in reincarnation might say, well, tell me more about that, you know? Yeah. And something that you've learned along the way is um, this this thing called, which actually is a new term to me, but uh, past life regression. Oh, yeah. Can you talk us about that? Yeah. So so past life regression is essentially hypnosis. Like, like the breath work, hypnosis gets you into an altered state of consciousness, really just relaxation. Mm -hmm. It's not like stage hypnotist where, you know, it's like cluck like a chicken, whatever it's yeah. just. Yeah. It, you get into a relaxed state of mind and uh, just using words, a hypnotherapist will get you into a past life, real or imagined. It doesn't matter to me as long as it's meaningful. The reason it's called hypnotherapy is that we want to give you, help you get insights into your own issues uh, around behavior or relationship, you know, different patterns that you want insight into that don't seem to make sense in your life. So uh, through regression, through the yeah, hypnotic regression, we can get you into that state and then work you through different situations, let you experience, again, whether it's like a dream, you know, meaningful information put into symbolic form or whether it's a real past life, doesn't matter to me. Ian Stevenson and Dops uh, don't look highly on past life regressions for their research. Because we adults, especially, have read so many books or seen so many movies, you know, we don't know what's in our unconscious mind that we might conjure into a story. But the three and four year old kids have none of that context. That's why mm -hmm. they put so much weight in those things. But, but yeah, so I still do past life regressions for people and, and uh, have had a lot of success uh, giving them a, a more meaningful life, let's say. Yeah. And is, are there any um, like sort of transformative experiences that you might be able to share that where somebody's benefited from that? Oh, sure. Yeah. Well, uh, most of the really transformative situations have come through people's insights into relationships in their life. You know, why, why have my sister and I always fought? You know, yeah. this one woman, one of my first regressions, uh, she and her sister were always at each other's throat and could, couldn't understand. Well, she had a regression where she remembered being a, a Japanese soldier and she killed, uh, I don't remember what her sister was, but a, an enemy soldier. So they literally killed, one of them literally killed the other on the battlefield in that lifetime. And, you know, it, it carried over somehow. Uh, so, so she was able to forgive her sister and really shifted the dynamic of the relationship. So I, I again, I just say whether, whether or not that was a real, lifetime i can't say but that energy is real that that contentiousness that she was able to forgive and heal uh, really did shift and change her life yeah and and that's the key is that it was helpful to her and helped her work through that that's right one of my first regressions that i did for myself uh, i was handed my own life purpose you know so it doesn't it doesn't have to be you know healing necessarily it can also be just t tapping into your own internal wisdom because it's not somebody from outside of you. The hypnotherapist isn't giving me information. They just get me to a place where the information can just bubble up from my own intuition. So, so that brings me to, I want to give you just a minute to talk about the Hoffman Institute, which is your, your latest uh, endeavor. Personal growth strategy. Yeah. 
fits. Yeah, right? but it all it all fits together. It really does. Yeah. So you know, I, I've I've really gotten a lot of meaning out of Edgar Casey and his worldview, um, really trying to become more loving and, and authentic in my life. Uh, but Hoffman Institute is really where I got the tools to help me do that. The Casey uh, perspective is wonderful and really helpful, but it's more of a mindset than an active uh, tool. Uh, Hoffman Institute out in California, uh, they have a week-long process. They call it the Hoffman process, and it's super intensive. You do not have a cell phone or computer. You are basically cut off from the entire world uh, for that week, and you just participate in the process, and you look into your patterns that you developed from childhood. Uh, mine, One of mine, I had 82 but one of my main patterns was the nice guy pattern, which, you know, I am a loving, nice, kind person. And yet part of my pattern was doing that compulsively. Even when you hurt my feelings, I might just brush it off and laugh it off and whatever, not be authentic in it. Hoffman Institute helped me see that and uh, not be compulsive in it, uh, but more authentic in how I act and react with people. And uh, it's, I, I can't say enough about it. It's just phenomenal. After that week, I was, I was really shifted again. I had done a lot of forgiveness work uh, with my family and with past coworkers and just really felt light again and able to move into this next phase of life. Well, and what I think is, is really amazing is how you've used these personal experiences that have helped you. And then you kind of turn around and help the organization to advance their mission. And that's what your career has become. Absolutely. I mean, you got to give back to the things that have given to you, right? Whether yeah. So, yeah. So I guess with that, you know, going back 30 years, you and your wife decided to take this trip to find yeah. the meaning of life. And now like reflecting on it, you know, there's still a lot left. But mm -hmm. I mean, if you were to kind of just take stock of where you are right now, like, can you say that when you went on that one year trip to find the meaning of life that mm -hmm. you found answers? <laughs> Absolutely. There's no doubt about it. Part of it, you have the answer as well, which is follow your own inner guidance. You know, that, that's a huge thing. And, and just really trust that you're taken care of. If you follow your inner guidance, you will always be taken care of. And my mystical experience, the, the lesson from that is that only love exists. We can go into the whole philosophy behind that because it doesn't seem to be the case when we look around and we see a lot of the darkness, but it, it, it's, it's essentially a big uh, laboratory that gives each of us points of consciousness, divine consciousness, uh, a laboratory to, to experiment, you know, make choices. And we can try different choices. And I'll give you a hint. The, the best choices are along the lines of love and forgiveness. Uh, I love that. Can. And I just think, you know, I think, for you, this isn't something that you read in a book. This was something that you felt and experienced yourself. And I think that's, I think that's what, where the magic comes from in all of this. Absolutely. I agree. And, and I will say that, you know, I'm only one point of light. You're another, and everybody else is a unique point of light uh, to, to have a unique expression. So not everybody has to follow my path or yours. They have a unique path to themselves. Uh, so just stay true to your ideal and uh, good things are going to happen. Yeah. So with that, you might have already answered this question, Pat, but when uh, when we talk about people that are feeling that call to adventure, but maybe yeah. they're experiencing resistance, what, what advice would you have for those people? Find a way to trust yourself just and resolve to follow your own intuition. You know, I know it can be hard, but if it is hard, then find people around you who will support you. Because I'm telling you, only good things will happen if you follow your own intuition. Yeah. And that's the advice from the practical mystic. <laughs> this is practical advice. It is. It to really is. I mean, that's, that's the whole thing. Honestly, I, I got to tell one more quick story, Scott. I know we're, we're getting close to the end here. But I, when, when we moved to Charlottesville without jobs, uh, I took the question into meditation with me. What should I do for a living? What should I do for a job? You know, I mean, a really practical question through meditation. And I got into my nice alpha brainwave state of meditation. 
And I saw this image of me standing in front of a group of kids teaching. And it was January at the time. And I thought, huh, I wonder if they ever need substitute teachers around here. There's a Waldorf school three blocks away. So I got out of my meditation. I called the Waldorf school. It was about 8.30 in the morning. And they said, uh, yeah, we do need subs once in a while, but you have to know something about Waldorf. And I said, oh, Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy. I, I, I know some of that. And they're like, oh, well, then sadly, the second and final teacher training of the year uh, happens in 30 minutes at nine o'clock. I'm sorry you won't be able to be here. I said, I live three blocks away. I'll be there in 10 minutes. <laughs> I was literally working for them by the end of the day, Scott. I was oh, that's doing amazing. Their aftercare program that very day. <laughs> that's amazing. So that's practical mystic right there, man. That is very practical, but you know, it takes courage too, because a lot of people might look at the clock and go, oh, I don't know, I got to go do this and that and that, but you had the courage to jump in. You're exactly right. Yeah, no, you you have to act. You can't just wait for God or spirit or whatever we yeah. call that to, to pick you up and do it for you. You have to flex your will and make things happen. Yeah. Pat, thank you so much for sharing all this. Um, today, we talked about DOPS. We talked about Edgar Casey. We talked about the Hoffman Institute. You've already shared some links with me. I'll make sure that those go in the show notes. But if people want to learn more about you or any any of these organizations, um, what, what are some other ways or, or what's your advice on how they can best do that? Yeah, I don't have a website, I'm sorry to say, of my own, but they could email me at patrickjbelisle at gmail.com. Uh, and I, maybe you can put that on your uh, page there too, Scott. Uh, but that that's that's about it. I'd love to talk to people uh, on the path. We can do that. And And finally, Pat, you have an incredible story, this mystical experience that leads to this life of purpose. Mm -hmm. And I am a hundred percent sure that at some point Hollywood's going to pick up on this story. <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> They're going to make a movie about you. And what I want to know is when they do, who's going to be the Hollywood actor that's going to play you in your movie? <laughs> oh man. Well, over the years, as as my hairline has shifted, I think <laughs> the answer will be different actors. I think uh, the most current person that people tell me should play me in the movie is Agent Coulson. Do you ever watch any of the Avengers movies? Yeah, or? Agent Coulson. Totally. I don't know yeah. who the actor is, but I know exactly who you're talking about. Yeah, too. Agents of Shield. You know, Phil. Yeah, Coulson. totally. He, he's he's my guy, and I love him too because he he overcomes his fear and keeps on his ideal fighting for the fighting for justice and doing the right thing. You talk about a hero journey. I love it. I can see it. Pat, what's your movie going to be called? Oh man. Well, we keep talking about the pra practical mystic. I guess it'd probably have to be along those lines, right? I love it. The, <laughs> the practical mystic starring agent Coulson. I wish I knew what his name was, but well, I'll have to look that up as well. Awesome. Um, this has been so much fun. Thank you so much for spending some time with me here today. And for those listening, I hope you've been inspired today as much as I have. I hope that Pat's story has encouraged you to listen to the voice inside that calls you to adventure because we want to hear your story next. If you have a story to tell or just need a nudge to create one, please send me an email. We'd also appreciate it if you'd help us spread the word by leaving a review and sharing or tagging Inspire Campfire in your social media. And until next time, I want to encourage you to get outside. Thanks for listening. Pat, thank you so much for being here today. You're welcome, Scott. Thanks for doing your good work. Take care.